Welcome to EWTN Live. I am not in Alabama right now. I am in the beautiful city of Baltimore, Maryland at the Knights of Columbus National Convention. And using this opportunity to be here, we are able to have a special interview. You know how I always welcome you and say that on EWTN Live, we bring you guests from all over the world, and many of our guests come to Alabama, but this time we've met our guest partway. So we've come here and we are going to introduce a very special guest. It is the Major Archbishop of Kiev and Galicia. Uh, he comes from Ukraine, where he is now the uh, Major Archbishop, and it is his Beatitude Sviatoslav Shevchuk who will be our guest tonight. Your Beatitude, welcome. It is good to have you here in the United States, and it's wonderful to have you on our program. Thank you for joining us. You have been a bishop for a little bit of a while. You, this is not uh, your first time consecrated you know, as a bishop. Where were you first made bishop? Well, um, I became a bishop when I was 38 years old. You were one of the youngest in the world then. For a year, I was the youngest bishop in the Catholic Church worldwide. Be careful, there's a precedent because so was Karo Wojtyla <laughs> at one time. Well, you know, um, we call this not um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, isolated event, but a God's providence. Yes, yes. But um, uh, the unusual uh, moment in that story is that I was ordained as an auxiliary bishop for the Ukrainian eparchy, which means diocese, in right. Argentina. Uh -huh. And so, um, speaking of popes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I went uh, as a new ordained bishop to Argentina in the 2009, and uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, Archbishop of Buenos Aires, uh, was a president of the bishops' conference of the Argentinian bishops. Yes. And he was the one who introduced me to the uh, uh, community of the Argentinian bishops. Uh -huh. Even more, I have to say that he was the one who explained me what does, it, that does that, what does it mean to be an Eastern Catholic bishop in Latin America, in the Argentinian uh, society. Yes. Well, a lot of Americans don't realize what a very diverse culture Argentine, uh, Argentina is as people from all over the world who live there. And there are many people from Eastern, Central, Southern, and Western Europe, as well as Latin America. Well, Argentina is a very unique country. Yes. And um, I have to say, I, I, I love Argentina. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a um, very large Ukrainian Catholic community in Argentina. These were the Ukrainians who did not like the cold. <laughs> Those Ukrainians went up to Canada. Well, uh, we have uh, almost four periods of the Ukrainian immigration to Argentina. Mm -hmm. First one started uh, in the former uh, um, Austrian-Hungarian Empire in the end of the uh, 19th century. Mm -hmm. The second uh, period of the Ukrainian immigration was just um, before the First World War, in the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Those two uh, periods of immigration was caused basically for the economical reasons. Sure. The third huge immigration to Argentina from Ukraine was between the First and the Second World War, from the uh, uh, re-established Polish state. Yes. Um, and the third, uh, fourth... Well, and, and again, so folks understand, what is now part of Western Ukraine, Ukraine. was 
in the Polish, the Polish state. Uh, state. Yeah. And the fourth uh, uh, huge number of Ukrainian immigrants came to Argentina after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So the last immigration basically was a political immigration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people uh, uh, with a good education, with um, uh, 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 good skills, high professionals yes. came to Argentina uh, as well. And the last uh, a relatively small group of Ukrainian immigrants came to Argentina after the fall of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. in the beginning of uh, 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is how Ukrainians uh, established themselves in uh, Argentina in several historical periods of uh, 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 the last century and for the several different reasons uh, as well. In the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, has taken great efforts to show care for all the larger community of Ukrainians around the world by making sure that there are bishops and priests, nuns oftentimes, and churches for them to maintain their Greek Catholic identity. So let me say who we are. Yes. <laughs> so we are Greek Catholics, but we uh, uh, are not Greeks. <laughs> right. That's right. We are Catholics, but we are not Roman Catholics. <laughs> That's right. So we are uh, originally Ukrainians, which uh, inherited the spiritual, liturgical, and theological heritage of the Kievan Rus, mm -hmm. which was uh, the common source of the uh, Eastern Slavs yes. in the Eastern Europe uh, today. We would call ourselves Greek Catholics because we maintain the Byzantine tradition, Byzantine rite. But we are in communion with the Holy Father. Yes. So we are fully Catholics. And this is a church that goes back to the 10th century, correct? Exactly. This year, Ukrainians, both Orthodox and Catholics, we celebrate thousand and thirty years of the baptism of Saint King Volodymyr of Kiev, mm -hmm. the ruler who decided to uh, uh, accept the Christian faith from Byzantine Empire, from Constantinople, and uh, Kiev is a baptism font of the Ukrainian people. Yes. But today, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church is the biggest Eastern Catholic Church. Of the 22 different Eastern Churches. Of 22 the, different Eastern Catholic Churches, right. we are the, the biggest church, yes. the largest. Yes. Uh, we have uh, uh, more or less 7 million Ukrainian Greek Catholics spread out in whole world. Yes. Um, in Ukraine, uh, we are religious minority because yes. Ukraine counts uh, today 45 million citizens and we are 10 percent of uh, the population of Ukraine's yes. Ukrainian Greek Catholics right but because of several reasons we have very big numbers of presence of Ukrainian Greek, Greek Catholics in different countries in Canada, yes. United States, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, uh, uh, in uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, um, in the Western Europe, mm -hmm. uh, we have our diocese, our eparchy in France, in Great Britain, uh, in Poland as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have um, new established communities in Italy, Spain, Portugal, even in Greece and in Holy Land. Yeah. yeah. Recently I received um, a, a group of our uh, a deleg delegation of the Ukrainian community from South Africa. They came asking priests for their spiritual needs. So because of uh, our lay people, because of our laity, our church was brought into the different continents. Our church was incarnated into the different cultures. Mm -hmm. 
And afterwards, uh, my predecessor were sending priests. And afterwards, we uh, create our structures. We uh, received our bishops, our metropolitans, who are leading Ukrainian flocks in different countries. So today, we pray in different languages. Mm -hmm. When I was a bishop in Argentina, my, uh, my uh, majority of my service I uh, have done in Spanish. Our church in Brazil uh, celebrate divine liturgy in Portuguese. Here in the U.S., in, in Canada, in, we pray in English. Right. We are Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, but we are not a church only for Ukrainians. And that, that's a, a good thing to make a note of, that Roman Catholic or any other Catholic who goes to a Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church receives the same sacraments, is fully eligible for the same sacraments, and uh, we're part of the community. And I love going, especially when you have food festivals. <laughs> These are wonderful. I think that the presence of the Eastern Catholics, Eastern Catholic churches in the Catholic communion shows the beauty of the Catholic Church. Exactly. Uh, the richness of the Catholic Church. Uh, because we can share so many different experiences of God. Mm -hmm so many different theological approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, today in Baltimore, we enjoy the beauty and richness of the Catholic communion through the Brotherhood of the Knights of Columbus. That's right. There are a number of eparchs from a variety of different rites who are with us here today, you know, from the Melkite uh, uh, Archbishop of uh, Aleppo, and uh, the, so that's another Greek church, but it's Arabic using, Maronites, and uh, the, uh, see some of the other groups, I forget all the groups, you have so many of the bishops. Well, well, Ukrainian, right, of course, Ukrainian as well, Ruthenian, right, Ruthenian, that's, uh, that's uh, 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 bishops. The Ukrainian bishop is here. Also, uh, there is a, 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 a Romanian Catholic bishop in, yes. in the United States. So there is a beauty, richness, and I would say a joy uh, of communion of the Catholic Church. I think sometimes God is like a good cook. He makes sure that there are lots and lots of different herbs and spices to make the sauce rich. And this is what we have. And the influence on each other it is a benefit. Whereas uh, having, without the Catholic structure, it's very striking to me, having lived in places where there are very few Catholics, without the Catholic structure, there's less diversity. The Catholic structure is like the, the skeleton of a human body. It allows for great diversity of the other organs. Whereas when you have an oyster with only a shell, there's not too much diversity of organs <laughs> inside. Yeah, it's this, true. Is, this is something where we have, we have a lot to be thankful for. I'd like to address though, you know, you've now moved to Kiev and you are the major archbishop and therefore the head of this church. Uh, and that's a, an important distinction. The Pope is the successor of Peter, but you are truly a successor of the apostles as the head of a particular church, uh, as are the patriarchs of the other particular churches. How long have you been the uh, major archbishop? Well, um, I was elected as a major archbishop by the, the Synod yes. of the Ukrainian Catholic bishops worldwide. Yes. Uh, and it happened in 2011. Okay. When my um, great predecessor, his beatitude, Cardinal Huzar, because of his um, uh, a state of, 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 of health yeah. presented his resignation to the Senate and to the Holy Father. So, and I was elected, uh, but uh, I think 
for everybody in our church, especially for myself, it was a big surprise. Because Why? What, my, what was bishops, the surprise? my bishops uh, made their choice, uh, made their elections, and they elected me as a youngest among them is that right? to be a primate of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, it, well, some, some outstanding word of the Holy Spirit, I have to say. Yeah. And um, as a major archbishop, elected almost uh, uh, seven and a half years ago, I can uh, explain that my pastoral care has three levels. Mm -hmm. First of all, I am a bishop of the Arch Eparchy of Kiev, uh, which means capital and five regions of the central Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, in 2005, my predecessor, Lubomir Huzar, he moved his see from Lviv back to Kiev. Yeah, so folks understand, Lviv is a city, a city of that the is western on the west, Ukraine. Oh, very close to the Polish very border. Close to the Polish border. And Kiev and is at the uh, Kiev center. Kiev is a capital of Ukraine, yes. where actually our church was born. Right. So. Uh, our church with the Karl Huser returned back to his origin. Uh. The second level of my service is a uh, metropolitan of Kiev Halic and a head of the bishops in Ukraine. Because we have four metropolis in Ukraine. And uh, uh, I supposed to serve not only to the people of my diocese, my arch eparchy, but to lead the synod of the bishops of Ukraine as well. And so and again, folks understand, uh, because sometimes the divisions and terminology are not so well understood, a metropolitan bishop is an archbishop, and he has a province yeah. that would include other bishops, other bishops that he would call for local issues. Definitely, definitely. He doesn't have real authority to order them, but he calls them. Yeah, but to be a center of communion between them. Yes, yes. And so, you are the one who is the center of communion for, for the bishops, bishops and metropolitan in Ukraine. Right. But the third level of my service is to take care over Ukrainian uh, 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 Greek Catholics worldwide. Yes. So once a year we held a synod of whole Ukrainian bishop from the whole world. And uh, 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 my role is to be a center of unity of that church yes. which or originally uh, comes from Ukraine. Yes. But has become a global church, yes. which lives, serves in different uh, countries, prays in different languages, uh, has a joy to be open to different nations. Mm -hmm. As I told that we are Ukrainian church, but we are not a church only for Ukrainians. When I was a bishop in, in Argentina, we have many parishes where ethnical Ukrainians are mi minority. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, even even in the U.S. in Canada, there are there are uh, parishes where so many many uh, uh, faithful from different ethnical uh, background found found themselves uh, uh, very um, very comfortable in our parish in our right Absolutely. and uh, became greek catholics in and it's something that we see in the other rites as well I mean, we have a number of uh, very beautiful lebanese women they marry folks who are from you know alabama and i'm sure you, your people see the same that we do at the Maronite Church. When folks come from some of the other traditions and they marry in and they experience one of the weddings that we have, it's not a few nuts 
a few mints, a little punch, and you go home. We know how to do weddings. And it's a, it's a, a sharing of a cultural joy, not only over the marriage, but over the life of a married couple and the hope for children and this excitement at, at weddings that I don't think Ukrainian weddings are too different than Polish weddings in terms of the excitement and joy and singing and eating and such. But I have to say that those so-called mixed marriages, it's a good occasion to share our Christian identity. Yes. Because we as um, um, a people who uh, inherited the richness of the baptism of Prince Vladimir and the richness of the tradition of Kievan church, we are uh, able to share our own experience of God. Because we as a Christian, we believe into the incarnated word. Mm -hmm. God, which became flesh and history. God incarnated into the history of the specific nation, specific uh, uh, people of God. And we can share our own uh, richness, our own experience of God's incarnation in the history of our church with the Christian worldwide today. And I think that, ki that kind of uh, so-called mixed marriages, it's a good occasion for us to be open, mm -hmm. to share, mm -hmm. to, to help others uh, recognize the um, vibrant and living presence of the incarnated Christ in today's life of the Church. A number of people I've known around the uh, North America who go to Divine Liturgy at the Ukrainian Greek Catholic churches and sometimes you Ruthenians and other communities love the sense of the incarnation that is manifested in a liturgy that is extremely rich in prayer but also in the senses being filled with sound and smell and movement uh, and for those who receive Holy Communion even in taste that this is a very attracting uh, and, and the beauty of music you know the the attraction of the chant in the Byzantine church uh, and the, the specific differences that belong to each community as they sing the world into being, you know, and sing about God. This is something that is also quite wonderful. I'll take this opportunity to invite all our listeners to visit Ukrainian Catholic Parish near, near, nearby you. But, oh, absolutely. Please come. Absolutely. Cla come, come and, and visit us. Um, and um, you can um, taste that, um, I would say, uh, sense of the divine liturgy. Mm -hmm. Why we um, uh, underline the word divine? Because according to the concept of the Byzantine liturgical tradition, the main celebrant during the liturgy is Christ himself. Yes. And church, as a bridegroom, is concelebrating with him. So when we go to the church, when we participate into the divine liturgy, God himself is serving to me. Mm -hmm. As in the parable of the Good Samaritan, we can, we can uh, uh, read that uh, uh, Good Samaritan is Christ himself who comes to heal my wounds. So he is a main servant. And we, we just have to come and to give him possibility to serve me. This is something mysterious. Absolutely. But we would never say in the divine liturgy, according to our tradition, the Mass is ended. Not because the Mass is never ending story. <laughs> That's right. But because after 
the divine liturgy is finished, starts our liturgy, my service, the liturgy of life. I have experienced the divine service in the church. Now I suppose to imitate the divine servant in my everyday life. Mm -hmm. When I received a service from Christ himself, I have to serve to those who are in need. So this is uh, the logic, the concept of the divine liturgy according to the Byzantine tradition. In, in fact, it was a mistranslation in English to say the Mass is then it go in peace, because that wasn't in the Latin at all. It's just go, you are sent. Absolutely. And in this, the same liturgy, and sometimes the, the other thing that we have danger of in the West is that we think of the liturgy as an expression of ourselves. And in the Eastern liturgy, it is an expression, or rather, an entrance into the worship and liturgy of heaven. Divine liturgy is an icon, yes. an image of the divine reality, a, heavenly reality. And breaking into heaven, and heaven is breaking into our, into world. our world. This is even the importance of the icons that show the two worlds are breaking toward each other. But speaking of breaks, I have to take a break. <laughs> And we have to take a little bit of a break now, but we will be back because I'd like to talk more about the situation in Ukraine for Christians and particularly Greek Catholics today. So we ask you all to please stay with us. Welcome back, and I'm Father Mitch Packle, and I'm still in the great city of Baltimore, Maryland, at the Knights of Columbus National Convention. It's a delight to be here, but it's a real delight to have this interview, this opportunity to meet with his beatitude, Sviatoslav Shevchuk. Your beatitude. Welcome back. We want to continue on. We started a great discussion about some elements of the Greek Catholic Church and how international it is and how this is something that we don't just read about what you're doing in Ukraine or hear about it tonight, but we also can all join in. This is something for all of us to participate. You are invited. <laughs> yes. And remember, well, if you live in Australia and you're listening to this, you're still invited because the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church invited you and tell your local pastors down in Australia or over in Canada or wherever else you are, you've been invited personally. But we'd like to talk about the situation in the, uh, United, in the Ukraine right now. My impression of the Ukraine, having read a number of books of the history of the Greek Catholics in Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union, is that this has been one of the churches that suffered the most in the history of the world. I often point out to my audiences that in the history of Christianity, there have been 75 million martyrs. 40 million of them were martyred in the 20th century. 
the bulk of those martyrs were in Eastern Europe, especially under the communists. Of course, the majority of them would have been Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, and other Orthodox communities, other Christians, and the Greek Catholics in many ways were singled out in the time of Stalin for a variety of reasons. And the Ukraine, the, the, the suffering of the Ukraine, the engineered mass starvation of people in Ukraine in the 1930s as part of the five-year programs and all sorts of economic nonsense. This is tremendous, tremendous amount of suffering under atheism and communism. And now there's a new situation. Now, a new situation in Ukraine and all of Eastern Europe with the collapse of Soviet Union and new entities all over the region. Now that you are back in Ukraine as the major archbishop and living in Kiev, what is your sense of the present situation? Well, for mm, centuries, Ukrainian people had no their own state. And very often, only the church represent uh, 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 the simple people uh, in the relations with the different states, international society, and uh, the Catholic Church worldwide. Yes. It is why my predecessors, like Metropolitan uh, Andriy Sheptitsky, mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, confessor of the faith, yes. uh, Patriarch Yosef Slipy, who spent mm -hmm. 18 years in uh, 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 Stalin's concentration camps in Siberia, they were a unique voice of uh, uh, this persecuted nation. As uh, well as many martyred bishops, uh, I've been to the shrine of uh, Blessed Vasil Velichkovsky up in Canada. Yes, uh, He was released from prison, but when he came to uh, Canada, he died there from the poisons he had been given in the prisons. So in 1945, after the end of the first of the Second, Second World War, uh, when the Western Ukraine was uh, uh, conquered by the Soviet army, uh, Stalin started severe persecution of our church. So uh, even before the end of the Second World War, in the April 1945, all our bishops were imprisoned. Mm -hmm. Uh, majority of them were killed or died in the in the con concentration camp. Uh, only two of them, uh, Blessed Vasil Belichkovsky and uh, 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 my great predecessor, uh, Patriarch Yosef Slipy, were released from the Soviet Union uh, on time of uh, 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 the President Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. were some sort of relationship between Holy See and the Soviet Union were established. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to say that in the time of the Soviet Union, our church was a biggest group of the social opposition against the atheistic regime. Mm -hmm. That even that uh, bloody persecution inflicted by Stalin cannot annihilated and destroyed. It is why the experience of our church uh, during the uh, communist persecutions is an image that no one can destroy the Church of Christ. Right. Because the Church of Christ is a body of the risen Lord. You know the famous quotation of Bonaparte? Yes. He said to the Pope, that I've destroyed the Catholic Church by capturing you, making you my prisoner. And I believe it was Pope Pius VII said, 
If we priests haven't destroyed it in 1800 years, you don't have a chance. Exactly. I started my way to the priesthood in the underground church. Is that right? Wow. I remember that situation of the persecuted church, especially, especially in the uh, 80s, uh, 1980s. Um, I spent two years in the Soviet army as a soldier. <laughs> But uh, then, after uh, uh, of the historical meeting between uh, Holy Pope John Paul II and the President of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, mm -hmm. our church started to declare their existence. And uh, it was real resurrection of the church. We were not afraid anymore to manifest who we are. We were not afraid to demand a freedom in the Soviet Union. And many, many uh, um, experts would say that because of the resurrection of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Soviet Union collapsed. That's an, well, there's something that was very spiritual about the collapse of Soviet Union. It was not just politics. Definitely. This is something that was an enemy that used great hatred of the, the, the church, of God, of Jesus Christ, and they collapsed, we didn't. By the way, I, I got to mention that this is not Ukrainian music. <laughs> this is uh, an Irish marching band, and they're going to be some of the background music. We apologize that we're trying to talk over them, but um, we're going to do our best to continue our interview. So 26 years ago, Ukrainian state was re-established. And today Ukraine is an independent country. Yes. The size of our country is about the size of the state of France. And we are a big European country yes. situated in the Eastern Europe. Yes. But four years ago, our country was invaded by Russia. The peninsula of Crimea was enacted. Right. And Ukraine has uh, uh, suffered the invasion of Russian troops into the Eastern Ukraine into the region of Luhansk and Donbass. Yes. So almost for four and a half years, Ukrainian society, Ukrainian state, is a victim of the direct aggression of our neighbor. Yes. And it's, in one sense, it's also been part of a, an aggression Stalin had done by displacing many Ukrainians out and then putting in non-Ukrainians, Russians and others, to resettle so that he could help to destroy or undermine some of Ukraine's strength and identity. So it was a policy of Stalin to uh, uh, destroy even existence of the Ukrainian nation. In 1933, it was a big starvation in Ukraine, yes. so uh, called Holodomor. Mm -hmm. uh, around 10 million of Ukrainians were killed by hunger on that time. Yeah, they, they, so folks understand what had happened was the food was grown, they took the food from the people who grow it, and then they sold it for cash so they could build this Red Army. Even more, the territory of Ukraine was surrounded by Red Army. So people were not allowed to come out to the other regions in order to find the food. So they were just trapped. They were trapped. Yeah. So that kind of genocide, I call them cheapest weapon of mass destruction yeah. in the world. Yeah. And also, a policy of Stalin was to kill the people and to uh, 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 remove them from this, uh, their soil. Yeah. But my predecessor, Karol Huzar, 
used to have such a joke that Stalin was a big missionary cause for our church <laughs> because he disseminated Ukrainian Greek Catholics in whole territory of the Soviet Union, Siberia, yeah. Kazakhstan, Russia, whole territory of today's Ukraine. So it is how he helped our church to become a global church, <laughs> even in the territory of the former Soviet Union. And this is something where Christians who experience dying with Christ, who experience the cross, also see how Christ transforms the cross into the resurrection. Going back to the Jerusalem church, when they were persecuted, they were forced to go out from Judea to other places and preach the gospel around the world. So also did Stalin do for the, the Greek Catholics of Ukraine. But also I have to say that the major environment where church was, was uh, 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 surviving was a family, Christian family. And I used to say that in the Soviet times, family saved the church. But maybe today, church has a duty to save a family. To return the favor. To the, the favor. Is, there, is there a breakdown of family in Ukraine today? Well, we have some, some uh, modern crisis of family, uh, family as an institution in Ukraine. But still, we enjoy uh, the existence of the Christian families, where the faith, the Christian faith, is transmitted mm -hmm. from parents to their children, right. from the old generations to the new generations. Right. So the church, in the history of our people, was a soul and strength of our nation. Yeah. And today, um, I, I have to say that some sad moments of the history are repeated. Um, the current situation in Ukraine is not a conflict between Russian and Ukrainians. It's not a conflict between Orthodox and Catholics. It's a conflict between two uh, 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 projects of the development of the post-Soviet society. Should we move forward uh, to the European democracy or should we come back to the time of the Soviet uh, dictatorship? Mm -hmm. So from the side of Russia, we have the invitation to come back <laughs> to the restoration of the Soviet empire. To the Soviet they, pride. they put their invitation on lead <laughs> instead of on a nice piece of paper. And the invitation means the military invasion. Yeah. And uh, uh, repeating to the mass destruction of the people and the free society. Yeah. So the cause of the Ukrainian uh, uh, fight today is the defense of human dignity human right, freedom, and democracy. Yeah. It is why my opinion that the war in Ukraine is not a Ukrainian war, but the war in Ukraine is a war against humanity, against democracy. Yes. So this is not only about us in Ukraine, but it is about you as well in the USA. Very much so. And this is something that we we have to keep very much in mind that this ten, there, there's a certain so-called progress or progressivism that wants to see certain people and states so in charge. They think that they can run so much better the world than folks who have freedom that they are willing to use notions of progress to stifle human freedom and dignity and life itself. This has been the struggle since the French Revolution, not only in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, but also Western Europe, 
and you know with the Nazis who were very progressive about state control but uh, and we see it in this country and other elsewhere it's an an attitude that only our faith will strengthen us to give a clarity of thought about human dignity that includes freedom and religion has to be that means of doing so. Definitely. And I have to say that Ukrainian project, project of free, independent country, is supported by all churches and all religions in Ukraine. Oh, good. Catholics, Orthodox, even Jews and Muslims. Mm -hmm. Why? Because only uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union the religious freedom was established in Ukraine. And it's something I, I like to point out to people that they talked about freedom of worship. It was in the Soviet Constitution. But that's a trap because freedom of worship means you are free to do your worship inside the church. Outside the church, you have no freedom. If your community is registered by the state. Right, right. But our church was liquidated and, and we were not allowed to worship even in our houses. <laughs> right, exactly. That, that, and that's one of the things, that freedom of worship is a trap. I became very concerned when President Obama was using that language. Now, he may not have been so precise, but freedom of religion is a different situation than freedom of worship. Freedom of religion allows religion to permeate all the society. So Ukrainian society today is multi-ethnical and multi-religious society. Yes. But um, with this aggression against Ukraine, people from different churches, different nationalities, uh, felt themselves for being a citizen of the free and independent Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would not accept this military invitation to come back to the Soviet <laughs> times. Good. And I have to say that today in the front line, almost uh, 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 40, 50 percent of Russian speakers are defending free and independent Ukraine. Is that right? So it is why I have to say that that conflict that we suffer in Ukraine, uh, that war which is called the hybrid war, because it's conducted not only with the weapons, but with economy, with fake news, uh, 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 with different uh, Mm, international, uh, uh, I would say, manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that war uh, 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 is a catalyst of the re-establishment of the born of new political nation of Ukraine. So Ukrainians, both Orthodox, Catholics, Jews and Muslims, uh, Protestants, uh, they realized that Free Ukraine means freedom for all. Yes. Freedom of uh, uh, religion. Mm -hmm. And for that freedom, Ukrainian people are able to give up their, uh, uh, our life. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and this is something where Americans need to have a sense that our support of freedom and freedom of religion is not just a nicety. It is something about the very life and vibrancy of every aspect of society. And that religion is truly something that creates cultures and Definitely. creates societies. I, our ancestors, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, Germans, they were all barbarians. <laughs> it was when they were converted to Christianity that they developed these societies and cultures and beauties that are astounding to this day. 
Uh, Nut, do you sing many songs of the ancient Ukrainian barbarians? Well, you sing some? Some of them, yes. So, but how many compared to the chants of the church? The chants of the church are far more overwhelming than the barbarian songs yeah. of yeah. long ago because they're more beautiful. <laughs> but I have to say there is one more uh, uh, argument which I would like to share with you. Uh, for 10 years, I was a professor of the moral theology in yes. the U Ukrainian Catholic University mm -hmm. in Lviv. And I used to teach my students that the recipe of free and successful society is a social teaching of the church. And even more, that social teaching of the church is an efficient means for the evangelization of the modern society. But I have to say that I understood those sentences only right now, when I became uh, a head of the worldwide church. Yeah. Do you know why? What's that? Because when war in Ukraine started, we understood that the major cause of Ukrainian uh, uh, fight is a dignity of human person. When economy, money, are more precious than in human life, it means the end of the democracy. You're right. The second principle of the social teaching of the church is a common good. In today's society, so fragmented by the extreme individualism, the whole notion of the common good is under a threat. But we realize in, in Ukraine that the independent state is a common good of our people. Mm -hmm. Freedom, freedom of religion is a common good. Even economy is supposed to be a common good for our citizens. Even a political life. When politicians would not understand that they are supposed to be united in the name of the common good of your nation, what kind of free and successful society we can build? Yeah. The third principle is solidarity. When war started, we had two million internally displaced persons. And because of outstanding solidarity of Ukrainian society, those people find house, attendance, hospitality from everybody yes. in different parts of, of Ukraine. J just allow me to make some, some, uh, some example. When Germany get a million of migrants from Syria, that million caused almost a collapse of the political system yes. in Germany. But the level of econo economy in Germany is far stronger yes. than the economy of Ukraine. And we get two million internally displaced persons. So solidarity is very important issue. And fourth one is subsidiarity. The personal in initiative. Right. It, my personal responsibility for the good of my family, of my city, of my, my country. So it is why I can reaffirm that the social teaching of the church is very efficient uh, uh, tool, way for the evangelization of modern society. Your beatitude. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we've run flat out of time. Would you give us your blessing in these last few seconds? May God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for watching and joining us, and hopefully we'll have you back again sometime, and maybe even in the Ukraine. God bless you, and good night.